Morning, church. My name is Joshua McLaren. I am a pastoral assistant here at Wellsboro Bible Church, and we are so thankful that you have joined us this morning for worship. Now, if you are new here, we want to welcome you, and I encourage you to visit us at our starting point ministry. There, we have uh, helpful staff and information about Wellsboro Bible, uh, how you can get connected. If you have any questions about the church, uh, we have uh, helpful people there to answer those questions for you, and we want to bless you with a gift. Uh, we have a mug in here. We have um, some information about the leadership, and we also have a book in there entitled, What is the Gospel? And that is our drive here at Wellsboro Bible Church. The gospel is the center of everything we do. So we want you to know what that is. Next, I'd like to point you to your check-in tablet. It is this sunrise, sunset colored tablet. Um, to your left, my right, on the arm of your chair. Uh, this helps us uh, keep you in contact and in the know of what's going on at Wellsboro Bible. So if you could fill that out, your name and email, it helps us keep you connected uh, with the things that are going on. Uh, my lovely bride, Lydia, sends out uh, the e-news every week, and that has a lot of helpful information. Now, we can't send you that unless we have your email, and uh, the check-in tablets are a really helpful way for us to get that. Next, I'd like to point you to your bulletin. In there, we have a lot of really helpful things. We have some dates of some events coming up. We have your sermon notes, which we encourage you to use every week. And we also have these blue prayer cards. Uh, scripture tells us to be praying without ceasing. And these cards give us an opportunity to be doing that as leadership and as a church, to pray and praise the Lord for the things that he's been doing in your life and to ask him to help in, in hard times and in difficult times. So if you have a prayer request or a praise, please fill out that blue uh, prayer card and fold it up and place it in the offering plate as it goes by. Now we have two special announcements this Sunday. The first is our hymn sing. So we as a church, we are 
hoping to, to learn to sing in a better way. Uh, so this hymn sing is a great tool for you to learn how to sing uh, the four parts. I don't actually know all the four parts, so I need to go to that YouTube classroom that Pastor TJ encouraged us all to go to a couple weeks ago. So this will be December 8th at 2 p.m. It will be at the church at 45 East Ave. And this is a blast. We did this in the summertime, and it was such a unique blessing to be able to sing praises to our God that have really stood the test of time, theologically rich and beautifully sounding songs as we sing them together. And we'll have the opportunity to fellowship afterwards. So we encourage you, if you uh, have a favorite cookie, which I hope you do, and if you don't, go eat some cookies, find out your favorite. Uh, bring a plate of those cookies so we can eat them and enjoy fellowship after the hymn sing. And finally, uh, we have an opportunity to be blessing our community by providing for physical needs, but then also spiritual needs. So it is time for the Salvation Army tree. We've done this in years past. And what it is, there is a Christmas tree in the lobby with names uh, of anonymous families that have needs this Christmas. Families that cannot afford things for Christmas. Not only toys for children, but then also things like boots and snow pants and coats that they need to stay warm. So this is our opportunity to bless them physically, but then also spiritually by including things like gospel tracts and Bibles in these gifts that we give these families and children. So what you can do is you can go out, grab a name tag, and please bring the gifts that are listed on the name tag by December 11th. And you can bring them here on a Sunday morning or throughout the week at the church at 45 East Ave. And if you have any questions about this, please see Sue Hackett. She is the point person for this, and she would love to answer your questions. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Well, let's take this time now to focus on the Lord. Try to move any distractions that you might have in your mind and think about how awesome God is. I'm going to break the silence with his word. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. What, what an amazing God that we're here to worship today. And this, th this passage in Psalm 95 is a declaration to stir us all up to, to come and, and worship him as is the song we're about to sing. Come praise and glorify. And it's, it's really asking us all to just come and praise the Lord. He is so worthy of our praise. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's stand and declare how good God is.
because he is the ultimate prize. He is the only thing that's worth living for. Let's arise. Let's live for the glory of Christ. Tabata. Rich is going to respond to this awesome grace of God by praising the Lord in prayer, praising Him for who He is and what He's done, how He's called us together as a people that we might build up and encourage one another, that we might uh, help each other in our faith. And then Holly is going to read 
uh, from 1 Corinthians 12, which I'll introduce in a moment. Please bow your heads and your hearts and pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we come together as one church, one body, one voice to praise your holy name. Your kindness and your mercy truly know no end. We revere you, the one who made all things, knows all things, every thought, every action, every feeling we, a depraved and sinful people, has still loves us, longs for us, and calls us to him. We adore you. You give us all that we need, even if that doesn't align with what we want. You provide for us not only food and clothing, which nourishes and protects our flesh, but your word and scriptures for us to know you. For Christ, who washed away our sin, for we un are unable to be righteous in your sight, and for him to serve as the head of the body. For the Holy Spirit, by which we are led, to trust in your great mercy. These wonderful gifts feed and protect our eternal soul. For this and much more, we praise you, our holy God. Hear our joyful noise as we sing to you in adoration as one church, one body, one voice together in spirit, in faith, in unity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now we come to our scripture reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which speaks of our spiritual gifts, that each Christian has a gift that's a vital and necessary part of the body that we glorify the Lord with. Um, now, this is a bit of a longer passage, so please listen with Holly as she reads 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there be, may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Amen. Thank you for the reading of God's word. At this time, Pastor TJ is going to come forward and pray a pastoral prayer for the needs of our congregation and the needs of some missionaries uh, that we support. And as he comes forward, um, just be thinking about how can you be praying for others in this congregation? How can you be um, asking the Lord how this church might have an impact uh, here in, in Tioga County and, and beyond? Well, good morning. I'm going to be praying um, specifically for a church that our church is connected to in Athens, Pennsylvania. Uh, called Calvary Baptist Church. The pastor there is Mark Cox, and there is a fine-looking photo of Mark and his family, his wife Grace, and their two beautiful little children. 
Um, Mark is in a situation at Calvary Baptist where he came in as a young pastor uh, without a lot of training into a very old church that was very set in her ways. And so he has faced some challenges just getting to know how as a younger minister do I relate to older people within the body of Christ. Uh, But they have done so well working together, and they seek to impact the community of Athens as well as the neighboring communities in that valley with the gospel of Christ. I would encourage you maybe even this afternoon to look up their church website. Just Google Calvary Baptist Athens, and you can learn more about that ministry. Here's why we're praying for them. Because if the gospel is going to go forth throughout our region, we need every single church being healthy and thriving that the name of Christ might be made known. So as a, as a church, we have just as much an interest in uh, Calvary Baptist as we do in Wellsboro Bible. We're part of a much greater kingdom than just our own. Uh, and then some of our missionaries who are in Alaska and very closely connected to some of our family, families here, and that is Leon and Donna Duell. So they've been serving in Alaska for a number of years with ABWE. Um, They are primarily coming alongside the local church, doing a lot of teaching and a lot of evangelism. Um, As you can imagine, Alaska is a difficult place to live. It's very remote. It's a very different culture. Uh, Some of the people there don't even speak English. It's just a challenging environment to work in. Uh, And Leon and Donna can use our prayers regularly. So why don't we pray together now for these uh, dear saints. Father, we come before you recognizing first that we need you. Lord, every Christian in this room needs your grace or we're just stuck. It's so easy to get attached to the things of this world. It's so easy to be discouraged and frustrated. And honestly, it's really, really hard to do the work you've called us to. It's hard to evangelize. It's hard to make disciples. It's hard to keep our focus. But with your help, we can do it or you wouldn't have called us to it. And so would you help us as a church to be effective in the lives of one another and in our community? Lord, as we think of this neighboring community of Athens, not far from here, Lord, we pray that the the lostness would decrease as a result of Calvary Baptist Church and the ministry that's taking, taking place there. Thank you for calling Mark and Grace and their family, and we ask that you would sustain them, that you would help them not to grow weary in this task of doing ministry there that their children would believe the gospel at a young age and that they would uh, be trained up to be like arrows that are shot out uh, to be a force against darkness. And Lord, for the other children who are in that church, would you help them as well to be raised by godly parents and nurtured that they might make an impact for the kingdom. Lord, for the older folks in that church, would you help them as they continue to learn how to relate to a younger pastor? Sometimes it's easy to get set in our ways or to misunderstand something because of a generational difference. And uh, we pray that they would be sensitive and gracious as they minister alongside their pastor, Mark. And Lord, for Leon and Donna, thank you so much for their impact. They have devoted their lives to serving you with the gospel. You called them into ministry and they said, yes, we'll go. You called them later in life to go to Alaska, something that a, a younger couple may resist because it would be so hard. Yet they faithfully answered the call instead of just comfortably retiring somewhere like so many do. Lord, we pray that you would give them the strength. Lord, help Liam with various health issues that he's had. Give him the strength to continue to do the ministry you've called him to do. Help them in their church to be effective, to carry Christ uh, to the folks who are there in Alaska. Give them wisdom to reach people in a very different culture from the one uh, that we're used to here. Father, thank you that we can partner both with a local church in Athens and missionaries sent so far away to Alaska. And we recognize this morning that they need our prayers. And so we do, as a congregation, lift them up before you, trusting that you will help them and that you'll help us. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to sing a song that we introduced last week. It's called, Oh, How Good It Is. And it's a song that speaks of unity in Christ, of a family of God dwelling together, honoring Christ. Um, And I want to draw your attention to, um, in in verse 3, it says, Oh, how good it is to embrace his command, to prefer one another, forgive as he forgives. When we live as one, 
we all share in the love of the Son with the Father and the Spirit. Uh, and I, it's important to recognize that the command to love one another and forgive is a command. <laughs> it, it's not something you only do if you feel like it. Because if you have been forgiven by Christ, he has forgiven you this great debt of sin. How could we not forgive one another and love one another? And I mean, we're sinners. You know, we, we're all a little rough around the edges in, in some areas, but the Lord has called us to live as one and to love one another and forgive each other. We're going to stand. Let's sing, Oh, How Good It Is. church body together, using our spiritual gifts, lifting one another up, encouraging one another, because we come around and serve this great God who makes all of that possible, who takes people who are so different and brings us together as one. Let's sing our great God. Your power is love, our 
the Lord by giving. And if you're not, uh, if you're a visitor here, please feel no obligation. We're glad you're here and worshiping with us. Heavenly Father, there is no one like you. Let every creature in the sea and every flying bird, every mountain, every field, every valley, all the moons and all the stars and all the universe, what an incredible host Sing praises to the living God who rules them by his word. Lord, every atom, every molecule, every star, every galaxy is yours. And you hold them together. And they testify to your glory and your goodness and your love and your power and your majesty. And so we praise you as the giver of every gift. Lord, you've brought us here today to worship you. You deserve the glory. 
We thank you for this offering. We thank you for the love that you have had for us in sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and rise again that we could be freed from condemnation. And in Jesus' name, amen. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the day. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Pastor Ben Garner is going to come forward and share with us uh, what's going on in kids' ministry today. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Nobody's going to tell me Merry Christmas. Thank you. Happy Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. I only say that because uh, we are starting our Christmas song rehearsals today in children's ministry. And believe it or not, it is coming. So the snow is here, the cold weather is here, but uh, we are getting our children ready for our Christmas Eve celebration, both in Wellsboro and Mansfield, and we sing a song, and they are going to be practicing that today. So if they come from Children's Ministry singing that, you know why. It wasn't just my fault. But good morning, everyone. So this morning in Children's Ministry, we're going to be looking at uh, the book of Second Chronicles, and it was Judah taken captive. So King Nebuchadnezzar uh, was an evil king that was used by God to bring his people back to him. So God uh, has sent prophets to the people there, and they chose to continue to live in rebellion and disobedience towards God, and he chooses to use an evil king. So that is what our students are going to be learning about today from the book of Second Chronicles. 
If you have children in grades uh, pre-K or nursery through sixth grade, there is a children's ministry for them. And uh, we are going to pray, and then we'll dismiss out of the auditorium for that. So would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, what a great God you are. Lord, we love you. We love the opportunity to come before you and to worship and sing praises and read scripture. Father, for the children that are sitting amongst us, uh, the young lives that they are, they're full of life and they're full of ideas and opportunities and the, and the world is continually shaping them. And Father, as we seek to show them the truth of your word this morning uh, through the book of Second Chronicles and talk about a people, your loved people that was taken captive and then uh, how they were punished and how they were brought to repentance. And Lord, I thank you that we can experience the same freedom and repentance through your son, Jesus Christ, today. Father, for the gospel that's going to go forth this morning through our children's ministry, would you bring uh, conviction to the hearts of the students there? Uh, Lord, I allow them to see their need for a Savior. Father, we love you and we praise you for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. If you have a young person in grades 1 through 6, they are now dismissed out the back of the sanctuary. The 4th through 6th graders will exit to the left. And if you have children in grades 6 through 12, we also have youth ministry that meets tonight at 45 East Avenue. If they are looking a little tired tonight, it's because they were awake all night, Friday night into Saturday. If you see them sleeping during the service, feel free to elbow them. I give you permission to do that. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Well, good morning, church. If you have one of these, grab it, please. I have Linda's, so she doesn't have one. Grab your bulletin. I just want to walk you through something that occurred to me this morning. Um, church is not a production. So what's happened this morning is not an event that you've attended. Um, these people who were up here leading the singing earlier, they're not a band that you came to see. Um, nothing about our gathering should feel like a performance to you because this is a participatory event. We are together here as a body, growing together according to the knowledge of God's word. So I just wanted to walk you through a little bit of what we've done and see if you can see that a little bit. So when you came in, you're out in the hallway, hopefully mingling with people. Probably you got here way more than like two minutes before the service started, I hope. Um, you saw the lights flash. That was me. <laughs> Sorry. But I wanted you to get in here so you'd hear the announcements because that's really important to our life as a body. We don't do anything that we just do because you're supposed to. So it's actually really important that we try to get in here and hear the things that our fine young man, Josh, is sharing with us. And there's a little song that happens before that. You'll see it's, it's actually listed in the bulletin. Um, it's not just something we tack on for fun. It's a song of preparation, Jesus, thank you. And we actually hope that it does help to prepare your hearts. Now, it's okay if you're in here and you're just talking in the back or something like this, but if you want to, it'd actually probably help you to engage in that. You're getting ready for worship. You're preparing. And then our welcome and our announcements are just meant to help us as a body understand how we're working together. And then there's the call to worship. One of my favorite things about our service is when we pause before... Before kind of the, the meat of the service starts, and we recognize our dependence on the Lord together through silence. We just sit there in silence together in this room waiting for the word of God. And then into our silence, what happens? The word of God is spoken. That's on purpose. We don't even say the reference to the verse. We just allow God's word to break our silence and reorient our hearts toward him. And we're called to worship, and then in response to that, what do we do? We sing. So come praise and glorify. Who were you singing to? Somebody tell me. One another. You didn't tell God, hey, come praise and glorify our God. You were telling each other, come, praise, and glorify our God who gives us grace in Christ. And we're declaring this is to the praise of his glory. We were singing to each other. We continued on, O church, arise. 
You're calling one another. Hey, get up. Put your armor on. We've got work to do together. We need this. Serve the Lord who's worthy. Hear the call of Christ, our captain. And then we respond to the Lord with the prayer of praise. God, you are so worthy. And Rich, brother, fine job leading us in a prayer of praise. Was that your first time? Yeah, thank you, brother, for leading us in that wonderful prayer of praise where you used words that helped us in our minds praise our Lord uh, in our seats. It's so wonderful. And then the reading of Scripture. Holly, where are you? Did she go out with kids? Where? With the kids. Is she sick? Sound like her voice was scratchy. I've been there. I've related to that. She doesn't care. She got up here in front of you, not trying to do a performance, but reading to you the word of God, which we all need. And God's word's not going to return void. It, it actually impacts our hearts. And then pastoral prayer, probably the highlight of the service so far. Just kidding. That was awful. I'm so sorry. Um, but in the pastoral prayer, we're recognizing, hey, it's not just about us. It's not just about these people in this room. It is about a church that's much bigger than us. And look, it's hard to sit there while some guy stands up here and prays. In our culture, we're not used to that. It's so easy to drift. But we shouldn't because it's not about us. It's about the kingdom of God. And we are in partnership with people around the world trying to see his name proclaimed. They truly need our prayers. And then our songs of dependence. We're talking about how good it is for us to be together with the body of Christ. It's a new song, but it's such a sweet song. And then we're just punching that home with hallelujah, glory be to our great God. And on we go throughout the service. Um, giving of our tithes so that the work of ministry continue. Singing about the wondrous mystery. Hearing about what's going on in our children's ministry. Friends, this is not an event you've come to attend. This is a body that you are a part of, and everything we do together matters, and it requires your participation for it to happen as it ought. We truly need you throughout the service and throughout the week, and you need the, the saints around you as well. And so now we're going to turn our attention to the Word of God. So if you uh, have a Bible, take it out. If you need a Bible, there are some men coming forward just now with Bibles in hand. They'll turn around, they'll walk back up the aisle. You just raise your hand. Make sure you get a Bible. If you don't own a Bible, you can actually keep this one as our gift to you. But you want to see it actually from the Word of God. We don't put this up on the screen. Again, because we don't want you to feel like you're at some show. We want you to open and engage with the Word of God yourself. It's so important. So we're going to open up to Ephesians chapter 4 where we've been the past few weeks together. And I'm going to read for us, uh, beginning in verse 11, just to give you a little bit of context. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, remembering that this is the word of God. It will do work in us as a church and in us as individuals. We really need this. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So we'll spend the rest of our time together just working through what this passage means and how it applies to us as a church, how it applies to you as individuals. But here's what you can do even doing the sermon, during the sermon. Um, you could pray for me. I, I need the Lord's help to be able to communicate his word in a way that's effective and powerful, that I don't shy back from it, that I don't add my own interpretation to something. I, I actually need your prayers to be able to preach as the Lord has called me to pre preach. And the people around you need you too. Look, people are tired. There's going to be people around you tempted to fall asleep. 
There's going to be t- people around you tempted to, to be distracted. There's going to be people around you who want to resist the word of God. You know what they need? They need your prayers too. Be praying that the Lord will help us all as a body as we walk through this word together. And so why don't I lead us then in a prayer just asking that, the God, will, that God will help us in that way. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. And I thank you for those who are with us this morning that don't know you. Lord, would you use your word to shape our hearts into the image of Christ. Help us to look more like you as a church and as, a, as people because of this text. And Lord, should anyone here not know you, and in a room this size, certainly there are those who do not know you, would you please convict their hearts and save their souls by your grace this morning? Please help me as I preach, Lord. I am truly dependent on you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you stroll through the streets of a small cemetery in Risertown, Maryland, you may notice the grave of Brooke Greenberg. Birth date, January 8th, 1993. Date of death, six years later. Or, I'm sorry, six years ago, October 20th, 2013. Brooke only lived to be 20 years old. And even at age 20, she weighed a mere 16 pounds and stretched only 31 inches long. Brooke never developed beyond the size of a toddler. She's one of few people in history who literally never grew up. Doctors have no explanation. Science does not have a classification for this. But one thing is clear to all. The body was made to mature, and when it does not, the results are devastating. When God wanted to give us a picture to help us understand what the church should look like, he used the body as an illustration. We are a body who's meant to grow and develop and mature, and if we do not, the results are tragic. Just like the human body, our church has many members, and each member has a a certain function that they play within the church. You may not even know exactly what that is, but just by being here with us and being a part of the body, there is a function that you are playing. And as each part develops and matures, the whole body grows. The body of Christ is actually meant to mature. That's why we've been in this series together as a church. Because we recognize that we have a responsibility according to scripture as a church to do what the Bible has called us to do. We can't just be a group of people who gather in a high school auditorium on Sunday and maybe if we have extra time in our schedule, get together during the week through a small group or just to hang out. We we cannot be that because scripture doesn't allow us to be that. So we're just asking the question of the Bible, what does God want us to be as a church? And so defining that, we're just going verse by verse through the scriptures. And the passage I just read gives us quite a bit of help. And so it is that we discover the goal of every Christian is to become mature in Christ. You can see that in our text. And you can remember from your understanding of Scripture that God made you, and he made you with a purpose. Everybody, as loud as you can or as loud as you're comfortable, why did God make you? To bring him glory. Glory. That's your single purpose in life. It plays out differently in every person's life, but the purpose is the same for every converted Christian. You exist to bring glory to God, which is why the mission statement of our church begins with those words. We exist to glorify God. He made us to do that. And I I bet you didn't know this, but this room is actually full of models. I mean, maybe you could tell when you walked walked in, you you, you could see. But, But not the kind of models you're thinking of. We're little models of Christ. The Lord made us like like a a miniature um, scale model of Christ. When we walk according to his word, when people look at us, they should actually see him. That's what we are as Christians. We're little Christs. We are models of him. 
So people should see Christ in you through the way you love others. People should see Christ through your kindness and your mercy and your care. People should see Jesus through the way you communicate. The things that you talk about and how you talk about them, they should demonstrate Christ. So should the way you spend your money, those resources that he's entrusted you. You should use those in such a way that other people see Christ through the way you prioritize your finances. Through the way, the way you take care of your stuff. The way you care for your things is a representation of what you understand about Christ. People should see Christ in the way you parent, in the way you work, in the way you treat your spouse. People should see Christ in the way you respond when your life takes an unexpected turn. People should see Christ in you when you're uncomfortable. Something we often forget is that maturity in Christ is not something that we're actually supposed to achieve on our own. So we all understand, I'm supposed to represent Christ. What we fail to remember or even think about is that our representation of Christ is not something that happens between God and me, the individual only. Our representation of Christ is a corporate representation. We represent him together as his body. And that's what this text shows us. In fact, demonstrating true Christian maturity is not something you are capable of doing on your own. God created you and he created me to be dependent on other Christians for our spiritual maturity. So the relationship with God, it includes with it an interdependent relationship with other Christians, just like the ones who are seated around you. So for a person to say something like, you know, I love Jesus, but I'm not interested in the church. I love the Lord, but organized religion just isn't my thing. I don't want that. I'm going to kind of do this on my own. I can find Jesus in nature. I can find Jesus in my living room reading my Bible. I can find him in our daily bread. I don't need the body of Christ. To say that is to rebel against the very word of God you say you're following. A relationship with God is includes an interdependent relationship with his people. The world would not have us believe that to be true. This is a nation that was built upon the principle that you should be able to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Independence is like the chief object of worship in our culture right now. You can be so independent that you shouldn't let anybody define you by anything except what you want, not even something like your gender should define you according to our culture. But the church is not called to think that way. We are called to be interdependent rather than independent. And our Christian maturity depends on it. And you can see that captured in the statement inside your notes that kind of summarizes our text. My maturity in Christ is dependent on my participation in the church. My maturity in Christ is dependent on my participation in the church. Look, that could be a bit of an inflammatory statement, depending on where you land. I just want to help you walk through the, the verses in this passage in Ephesians 4 and just see if this is true. I think you'll find that this is plainly communicated through the text. So what I want to ask you to do is just ask yourself the question, is this what the Bible says or not? We can't approach the text by looking at our lives and saying, well, based on what I see, this doesn't seem like a good idea. We have to base our lives upon the text, not the text upon our lives. So just see if this is true from the word of God. And we'll begin with this first point. I am on a journey from immaturity to maturity. I am on a journey from immaturity to maturity. That's true of every, every person. Look at verse 14. We're told that 
the leadership in the church, the members of the church, they work together so that verse 14 happens, so that we may no longer be children. It's right there. So think about your relationship with God. Um, We all understand that our relationship with God involves this process of maturing or being sanctified. So before you became a Christian, you were lost. You were dead in your sins. You, You were just separated from God. But then someone explained the gospel to you. So think about that in your mind. When did you hear the gospel? Maybe from a parent, maybe at camp, maybe in church, maybe from a stranger. Someone loved you enough to share the gospel with you, and they told you, apart from Christ, you are lost in sin and worthy of God's wrath. But if you place your faith in Christ alone for salvation, his blood will pay for the crimes that you committed. Instead of you dying and suffering in hell, Christ died in your place. So if you'll turn from your sins and trust him, he will save your soul. If you're a Christian, you believed that about you and about the Lord. You were lost, you needed a Savior, and he's it. And then you were told, well, now that you're a Christian, you need to be baptized. So you partnered with a local church. You told them your profession of faith. They said, yes, it sounds like you've genuinely been converted. We will baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as a sign to everyone and yourself that you belong to him. You've died to your old self. You've been raised with Christ. And you join that church and begin to get involved and learn and and you grow in the church, that's this process of spiritual maturity that begins after we're saved. In John 3, 3, Jesus describes it this way. When you become a Christian, you are born again. You become an infant, spiritually. So someone helped you in your infancy learn what to do in those early days. Someone helped you as you were maturing in Christ to know how to read and understand the Bible, to know how to pray, to know what it means to serve Christ, to learn how to evangelize and tell others about the truth. All along the way, people are helping you mature in Christ. Why? Because you were immature on a journey toward maturity. And maturity is seen in Scripture as being like Christ, It's to the measure of the fullness and the stature of Christ right here in Ephesians 4. None of us have arrived there yet. So guess what? We need each other to help us on this journey from immaturity to maturity. We're all on that path if we are in Christ. If you stay in your immature state, that's a really unhealthy thing to do. You would be like Brooke Greenberg. You just never grow. You never develop. And an unhealthy pattern develops that leads to death. Friends, we must not be content to remain as spiritually immature. Or as Paul says here in Ephesians, we must no longer be like children. And as children, there are a number of dangers. As a parent, I understand that my children are exposed to a number of great dangers every day that I'm not as susceptible to just because I'm bigger and more mature. Um, I still do things like falling down the stairs, but I'm not as likely to fall down the stairs if I'm not playing on them like my children are. Uh, Things like this where they're just in danger of things that as adults we understand. Well, the same thing happens to us spiritually. There are actually a number of dangers for us spiritually as we're maturing, and that leads to our second point. I'm in danger of being led astray. So verse 14 started, so that we may no longer be children. So from that we understand we we are maturing. And what, what are children like? Well, they're tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by three things. Let's just think, though, about what it means to be tossed and carried about by the waves. I just need to see if I'm in good company. If you love the beach, would you just raise your hand? Oh, I am in great company. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, I'm so sorry that your life is so difficult. You're missing out on such a blessing. 
So as a kid, I loved going to the beach. And I can remember one time as a child when um, I got knocked down by the waves in the surf. And, and I knew my dad was close by. I didn't know exactly where he was. But I, I started to kind of roll in the waves. And I couldn't tell which way was up. I couldn't catch my breath. I couldn't get my feet. And I was actually starting to panic. And my dad reached down after a while, probably letting me struggle to see if I could get out. And he just easily pulled me out. And a, a mature man had no trouble pulling an immature child out from the waves that might have killed me if he had not been there. When we are immature in our faith, which we all are all to a degree still immature in our faith, we're in danger of being like me when I'm five years old being tossed by the waves. There are things that can just crush us, cause us to be disoriented, make us feel like we can't get our feet, and cause us even to panic. And what are those things? Well, Paul lists three of them here in verse 14. The first is every wind of doctrine. The second is human cunning. And the third is craftiness in deceitful schemes. I'll just briefly explain what each of those mean. Um, every wind of doctrine. So think back to the analogy. Paul's talking about a child. A child has a difficult time discerning the world around him sometimes. In fact, there are people, loving people, who say false things to their children, and their children don't know any better, and they believe those things, especially this time of year. There are lies that are easy to get children to believe. There are a number of things in the world that a child fails to understand simply because of his maturity. Um, my children could not do physics, but they can do basic science, and one day they'll be able to do physics, unless they're like me. Um, we understand math. You start basic, and you move toward the more complex things. Why? Because at an early age, you don't have the capacity to understand all those things that you'll be able to understand when you're more mature. You may be gullible in some areas. You may just not be able to understand things in other areas. And guess what Paul's telling us? Spiritually, the same thing is true. There are doctrines that are so complex and so difficult and so hotly debated that if we're not careful, they will cause us to feel like we've lost our footing. They'll cause us to feel like we can't get any air spiritually. They'll distract us and knock us down, divide us. And Paul says that is not good. You need to watch out for this. Friends, there are all kinds of distracting things in scriptures that can confuse us. Read through the Old Testament and you will be confused before you get done, more than once. Read some of the doctrines in the New Testament and you'll be struggling to explain them. Read the book of Revelation this afternoon and see if you know it all when you're done. There are all kinds of things in scripture that are there for our good, but in our immaturity could trip us up. And we need to be careful of making a second or a third order issue seem like a primary issue when it's not. So Paul's encouragement here is as you mature, just keep the main things the main things. Let, as Alistair Begg says, the main things be the main things and the plain things be the plain things in Scripture. And as you learn and grow and pray, God will give you the wisdom to understand the difficult things as he sees fit. But even the authors of Scripture recognized that we're not to understand everything there is to know about God. We're infinite creatures. or We, we are finite creatures serving an infinite God. And we will not know everything there is to know about him. So if you're relationship with the, the rest of the body is what it should be, when you face these doctrinal challenges, you will be able to work together with the members and the elders to work through them in a way that keeps you from drowning as you develop sound doctrine. The next warning, as we're all maturing together, has to do with human cunning. Friends, in every generation, and ours is not exempt, there are charlatans who would love to use the church for their own advantage. Some people 
feel good about drawing a big crowd and then posting about it online so people can see how many people came to their service. I have no interest by God's grace in that. Actually, I was going in that direction when I was first called into ministry unwittingly. And the Lord kindly used his word to correct my heart and the church I was in to show me that's the wrong thing to do. Um, People can make money off a crowd. And a church is no um, uh, exception to that rule. So just this week I was watching a a sermon from a, a local church. And in that church, there was a preacher telling that congregation that their money is cursed until they give a minimum 10% tithe. And that's a popular doctrine throughout our country, that your money is cursed, and God will not bless you until you release the 10% to him, then he'll bless the 90. And they tell you, hey, you are going to gain financially when you give financially. These things are simply not taught in Scripture. You know what Scripture does teach us? To give cheerfully, to give sacrificially, which we should be just happy to do. But the New Testament doesn't give us a number that we're supposed to give. Probably 10% is a fine principle. But to tell someone your money is cursed until you release that money to the church, man, that is a selfish, awful lie. People are just tripping Christians up with these kinds of things in churches across the country. People are calling people into a room and saying, man, I want to tell you how awesome you guys are. You're doing so great. You have no idea how wonderful you already are. Guess what you don't need when you think that? A Christ who comes to you in your weakness and fulfills in you what you are not. It's so easy for men to just twist the truth a little bit. And you know what? You guys are awesome. You know why? Because of Christ in you. It's not because you're naturally great. Outside of Christ, we have nothing good in us. Our best works are filthy rags. We can't be afraid to shy away from the truth of God's word as a church. We must rest in it. We must know it so that we don't get manipulated into thinking the wrong things that sound good but don't quite line up with Scripture. So as a church, we need together to be watching out for those charlatans, those people who would use human cunning to distract us. Thirdly, we need to watch out for the schemes of the devil. That's what that third idea is, craftiness and deceitful schemes. There are demonic forces that we probably don't think about enough who would love to see the body of Christ die. The devil hates what we're doing here, even this morning. And if if he can do what he's been doing since the beginning, if he can just twist God's word a little bit in our minds, he can drive us so far from our Savior. Think about what he did to Eve in the garden. He's he's saying to her, did God really say this? Is this what he says? And then he misrepresents God's word to Eve, says that God's lying to her and withholding something from her. So she goes and she eats of the fruit and convinces her husband to do the same. They fall into sin. And that's exactly how the devil continues to work today. He just wants to twist things a little bit so that you're like, is this really what you want me to do, God? I mean, this really doesn't sound quite right, or, 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 or maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Maybe God didn't really say that. The, the devil would love to trick us into doubting our loving, perfectly wise God. In our journey from immaturity to maturity, we have to recognize that there is an evil one who would love to devour us. And you know what? A sheep all by itself is a lot more in danger of, of, a, of a wolf than a sheep that's together in a flock. Which is why in other places of scripture, the Lord calls his church a flock. So we actually need each other if we're going to stand up against the temptations and the lies of the devil. Which leads to our final point. I'm dependent on the church to help me mature. If you have a Roman Catholic background, I bet that point doesn't sound very uh, loving to you. 
Um, somehow in human history, it kind of got twisted that the church has this authority over people, that they have the, the real truth, that they have the ability to pronounce someone in or out um, based on their own will, the will of the church. And that's just incorrect. So when I'm saying this, I want to be sensitive to those of you who may have a different background and would hear that in a way that is not what I mean. But that doesn't change the reality of what Scripture says, that we are a body of people who are actually dependent upon one another for our maturity. So verse 14, we see some of the dangers we're exposed to. Verse 15, we get the antidote. So look at that. Rather. So just quick lesson in English. Rather does what? Contrast. That's a great word for it. It contrasts what you just heard to what you're about to hear. So rather, instead of that, you need to do this. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. As Christians, we have a responsibility to grow in maturity. Look at the pronoun. Who does the growing? We do the growing. We grow together as a body into the head that is Christ. And how do we do it? By speaking the truth in love to one another. This is amazing. So the process of moving from being a born-again newborn to a mature Christian in the stature of Christ is meant to take place in truth-saturated relationships within the local church. And what a joy it is to be cared for and loved by people like you. Man, the people seated around you who are in Christ actually care about you and love you. Some of them have been praying for you this week. They want to know where you're at so they can help you grow because they care about you. This is the antidote to being a child who's tossed to and fro by the waves and gives in to those three temptations we mentioned. The most loving thing you can do as a Christian is to speak the truth in love to other people in the church. In other words, the best thing for you to do for another person is to tell them what God said. For in his word we have everything we need. In Matthew 4, Jesus explained that his word is like food to us. It's our nourishment. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So without proper nourishment, you shrivel and you die. But when we feast on the word of God together, and when we offer God's word like food to one another in our conversations throughout the week, we are nourished and strengthened and growing in maturity together. You know, I am becoming a better parent because of you. I don't say that because you should say that. I say that because I mean it. I'm challenged and strengthened, and I have a good example from some of you. I'm a better parent because of the Christians at Wellsboro Bible Church, and I need to be a good parent because my parenting is a reflection of my understanding of the gospel. I'm a better husband because of some of you. You push me when you see me not loving my, my wife well as Christ loved the church. You give me an example of what it means to care for and love and lead your wives well. And I want to be like you as you are trying to be like Christ. That's what should be happening in the church. I am overcoming some of my fears because of you. You all know I hate flying. It's the worst. Why did they have to invent that? But... I'm, I'll just tell you, last time I got in an airplane, um, I sat next, to, I tried to sit next to Mike White, but he wouldn't give me the open seat next to him, so I sat by a stranger. And, and I was sitting there, and I wanted to be nervous. Like, I wanted to give in to the fear. And I, I can't control it. I'm telling you, my palm sweat right here, it just, it's just all tense and just nervous, anxious. 
And I want to give into that. I want to put my headphones in. I want to pull my hood up. And I want to just pretend I'm not on an airplane, go to sleep, wake up in another city, and be done. But because you all have been challenging me, I thought to myself, no, I need to apply the word of God in this situation. I need to trust that he knows what he's doing. That no airplane goes down outside of his sovereign allowance. That he has a right to take me in an airplane if he wants to. That God is good. That God's not surprised by anything. He's better at flying me than the pilot is. I just got to believe these things to be true. So I have a choice in my seat. Do I sit there and give in to the fear and check out, or do I engage and be here? So by God's grace, I sat there and I watched out the window as we went flying down the runway and through the clouds. And for every bump we hit along the way, I was just engaged because I knew that there are people like you challenging me. Some of you were praying for me on that trip. I'm better at trusting my Lord because there are other Christians in my life. I need you to do that for me. And you need each other to do that. Brothers and sisters, we have to stop seeing the church as some experience, some add-on to our lives. The church is not an event. It's not a location. It's not a weekly touch point. The church is not a place you go. It's not something you do. The church is who we are. When God saved you, he saved you intentionally into a family, the body of Christ. In his wisdom, God took the universal body of Christ, all Christians everywhere, and broke it down into local congregations like the church at Ephesus, the church at Corinth, the church in Rome, the church in Wellsboro. God means for you to be connected to a family of Christians who will walk with you on this journey from immaturity to maturity. Spiritual growth is a corporate process, and we need each other as we mature. You can see it in verse 16. From whom the whole body, that's referring to the church, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So I just want to illustrate this for you. Bear with me. So everyone raise your hand and put your pointer finger up. Okay, most people are participating. Thank you. So in a moment, I'm going to have you touch your toes with that pointer finger. But first, I need to go over some ground rules. You may not move any other part of your body. Your arm can't move, your hand can't move, your elbow can't move, your shoulder can't move. You may not engage your brain, your nervous system, or anything else. Okay, on the count of three, with those rules in place, touch your toes. One, two, three, go. Can't do it, can you? Keep it up. Why can't you do that? Your finger is dependent on everything else, including your brain and other things in you that you can't see, to do this. You cannot do this without the rest of your body. You can put your hands down. That's the illustration that Paul wants us to see here. We are actually dependent on one another to do the things that we are commanded by Christ our captain to do. We need the whole body. Not in some formal, get together, do what we're supposed to do and go home kind of way. We need each other in a real way, with real relationships and real care. Without the rest of the body, not one of us can fulfill the purpose God has called us to fulfill. And think of it this way as well. When God looks down on us, on his people, you know what he sees? He sees a body. He sees the body of Christ, and Christ is the head of the body. Yes, he still sees us as individuals. Yes, he still knows how many hairs are on your head. But when he sees his people, he sees an interdependent family that he has caused to depend upon one another in his sovereign wisdom. You need to be so meaningfully connected to the life of a local church. I'm not saying that as an advertisement to make Wellsboro Bible Church bigger. 
or anything like that. That would just be such a perversion of this. You just need this because this is how God works. Ephesians 3.10, it's through the church that the manifold wisdom of God is made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God created the church for his glory, and he means for us to be a part of it. Still, I have a fear that we'll, we'll misunderstand the text, or that we'll kind of reason it away because our lives are so busy. I know every one of us is so busy. Sometimes I wonder, though, is it the busyness that's the problem, or is it what the scriptures say that's the problem? I mean, can we really use the craziness of our lives as an excuse for not doing and being what God has called us to do and be? And here's what you got to remember. We are, we are uh, strangers and we are aliens here, as we learned in our series through 1 Peter. This place isn't our home, so we shouldn't live like everyone else here. We're, we're actually to live very differently as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And that differently includes living our lives with each other. So I just want to give you some practical ways to think about this before we leave. I'm not calling you to some formal ministry opportunity, though those exist in the church. What I want you to think about are some easy things that you can do. Um, you can show up for church. Just, just instead of thinking church is from 10 to 11.45 or whenever I get done with this sermon, um, Think church is from 9.30 to noon. I'm going to get there at 9.30. I'm going to spend time with God's people, and I'm going to stick around afterward to talk to them about what we've learned together. Just, just think of it that way. You're already here. It's not an extra thing in your schedule. Set the crock pot to go off a little bit later for lunch. It's easy. That's low-hanging fruit. There's no excuse not to be together in the morning for church. We can all do that very easily. Something else very easy that we should all be doing is praying for each other. Um, every members meeting, we give out a member prayer guide. And it just walks you through how you can be praying specifically for members of the church and those who are apart from us by way of being in the military or missions or something else. But you're praying for the family and the extended family of Wells Bible Church. Every single quarter, we give you a new one so that you can do that. Just grab that and refuse to say, I don't have time to pray. Pray for other people in the church. They need your prayers. God made us to depend in part on the prayers of others. So commit to praying in that way. Every one of us can do that. And something that's a little bit harder is being open to the people around you. Another thing that came with our culture, and I guess with our sin nature, is pride. We don't want people to see what's below the surface. We want to seem like we've got it at least mostly together. You will not grow spiritually if you hide what's really going on in your heart and in your life. And the Christians around you are the ones that, that in Scripture God told us to confess our sins to. Confess your sins to one another. Not that we can forgive each other's sins. The Lord alone can do that. But he's told us, share these things with each other so you can help each other. Stir each other up to love and good works. Be open with other people. Don't just have them over. Talk about normal things. Talk about things that citizens of the kingdom of heaven talk about. Ask other people how they see you doing. So just ask someone else in the church, how do you see me as a husband? How do you see me as a wife? Am I fulfilling my role as scripture calls me to? Ask someone else about your parenting. Am I parenting in a way that represents Christ and his authority well? And be okay with whatever they say. And be okay to answer a person honestly according to scripture. Remember, the best thing you can do for someone else is to speak the truth in love. Don't just act like everything's cool because it's usually not. Tell someone the truth in love. Now, these are just a couple things, and not one of them requires permission from an elder, a ministry set up around it, a program for you to get involved in. This is just normal body life within the church. There are plenty of other things you can do if you want to get involved in those things, but start with these basics. Church, just love one another well. Speak the truth in love. Find ways to engage one another. This is where we have to start. And as we engage in this process for years together, by God's grace, 
We will be spiritually mature. And at the end of it all, you know what happens? Christ welcomes us home. And for all eternity, it's just bliss. Being just like him with no sin, no frustrations. Just glorifying him as we were made to do. Let's start that now as a body. Let's pray. God, what a challenge it is to stop living like the world and to begin to mature in Christ. But isn't that what you called us to do when you saved our souls? Turn from the world, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow after me. That's what we're doing as a people. Would you help us this week not to get distracted by the zillions of things that this world would distract us with? Keep us so focused on the cross that we can't help but love one another as you've loved us. Lord, we praise you for your grace and for this church. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Will you please rise for our benediction? And now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Thank you for being here. You are dismissed.